In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth the shall not kneel, shall not faint, by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Welcome to Online Church. I'm David Claus. And I'm Krista Claus. Before the pandemic as part of our life at Westwood Church, you might find us making pies for MCC, making soup for our life group, or dropping off and picking up our kids from youth group. On a Sunday, you would find us teaching Sunday school, chatting in the foyer, and trying to get our three kids to have meaningful conversations with other people at church. Now you'll find us in our basement on a Sunday morning trying to get our kids to have meaningful conversations with each other and with us. We still get to drop our kids off at youth group and we pick them up for which we are very grateful. One thing we missed during the early part of the pandemic 
was having other adults building into our kids' lives. We believe that it takes a village, and we are thankful that our boys can rub shoulders with other role models at youth group each week. You will also find us meeting with our life group on a Thursday evening. We don't have soup or pizza anymore, but we are so thankful that we have found a way to meet again. You may also find us around town. Dave is up at the university with the facilities team, and I am teaching math and foods at Cedars. During this season, we are thankful that we can still have some people over to our home for a meal. We are enjoying smaller groups of people and having meaningful conversations in different settings. But we do miss visiting in this foyer with all of you on a Sunday morning. We would encourage you to continue to meet together with people to build deep relationships. At the beginning of January, our family started reading through the Bible from the beginning. We have no aspirations of reading through the whole Bible in a year. But we did make it to the end of 2 Samuel before we skipped over to Acts to read what we are studying together as a church family. As we read Peter's quotes from the Old Testament in the book of Acts, we are reminded about how well the first apostles knew the Old Testament and how they were able to draw together the tapestry of the Bible for their listeners. Several verses that stood out to us are from David's Song of Praise in 2 Samuel 22, 2-7, and 17-20. to So I'll read that. Uh, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. He is my refuge, my savior, the one who saves me from violence. I called on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. The waves of death, death overwhelmed me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry reached his ears. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. They attacked me at a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. Dear Lord, thank you that we can still get together, even if it's online. I pray that you would move in our lives and speak to us through the worship and the message today. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, what's up, Westwood? We just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Hey, wherever you're at, let's just take a few minutes. Let's come into a place and a posture of humility and surrender. It's really important as we enter into the gates of God that we come with thankful hearts and thankfulness gets our eyes off of ourselves and onto God. And so we're gonna to look to him this morning. Let's sing together. Salvation, tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom, shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day is.
faithfulness God you are so worthy of praise so worthy of all that we can bring we just keep our eyes fixed on you today amen Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Nolan Hansen, for those of you that may not know me, and I'm a pastoral intern here. And it's such a privilege uh, and an honor to be able to preach in front of you again. Um, we are continuing on in our study of the book of Acts, where our theme, our overarching theme, is don't go to church, be the church. And now just before we get into the passage in question today, there's uh, something, a, a reality that I've kind of noticed within our lives that I just kind of wanted to, to put forward this morning. You know, in my conversations with friends and family, with fellow coworkers, and just even some of the people that I've had the privilege of meeting with lately, it just seems like the exhaustion and the feeling of being tired is so common right now. And I feel like compared to most seasons of life, this one is just kind of fraught with a little more stress and maybe a little more anxiety. And so this morning, I really wanted to take the time to actually 
pray a, a, a psalm over us as we enter into this time together. And so wherever you're at this morning, wh- whatever space you're in, I just want to ask that you would just uh, take a moment to stop, to be still. And as I pray Psalm 23 over us, I just want to ask that you would just close your eyes and just allow the words that I share with you this morning to, to really settle into your heart. So, let's begin. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I just wanted to continue to encourage us that in these challenging seasons of life that we don't forget to continue to pray and to make time uh, of devotion with the Lord. You know, it can be so easy in the strain of things that are upon all of us right now uh, to forget to do that. But I highly encourage you to not do that, to continue to press into the Lord during this time. And I guarantee you that he will lead you beside still quiet waters for your soul. So the passage today is Acts 3, 1 to 26. And it actually uh, is a shift. It's a, it's a pivotal shift in the narrative. So far we've had uh, the promise uh, of of the Holy Spirit coming and pouring on to the people. Uh, And as the disciples are going out now and they're living out the kingdom, both with one another and with other people, we we now have a bit of a shift where part of what's going to happen after today's sermon, we're going to see conflict and oppression arise as a result of the gospel being preached. And so to start our time together, I want to ask you a question that really resonates with our passage today. And that question is, what makes you come alive? What makes you come alive? You know, for some of us, it it may be a a passion or an interest. You know, something where you're so immersed into something that you just kind of feel yourself elevated in ways that other other, uh, sort of activities don't. Maybe for some of you, it's it's about a a relationship, whether with one individual or with multiple people, where uh, just being with those people seems to just like brighten your day. Or maybe, maybe it's an experience. Maybe it's something that you've had in the past or that you, you can still have now or, or that you're looking forward to in the future. You know, an experience whereby it seems to make you feel um, fully human in, in a sense. You know, for, for myself, if, if this were a question that was asked of me, I don't know, maybe five years ago, you know, that would have been easy. The question, the, the answer would have been basketball. For those of you that have, that have known me and been a part of my community of, of raising me, basketball has been uh, the very core of what I've done in my life. And for a good chunk of it, it's because it made me feel, in a sense, like I was made for it. Now, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm no NBA athlete by any means. But there was something about playing that sport that I found myself just f- in, alive in ways that I couldn't even describe. And so throughout my life, as I entered into high school and I found a lot of success in the sport, I pursued that feeling. You know, success and doing well in the sport was one thing, but pursuing that feeling of, of, of what it made me feel, like, like it was almost like an identity. It was, it was something that was just so strong and so core within me, I sought after it with everything I could. And as I did that, though, I slowly and gradually put my faith to the side. See, I'd been a Christian since I was five years old. My parents had raised me in church, and and my church home being Westwood. But as I pursued basketball, as I continued to follow it and allowed the success to build in my life, I ended up going further and further away. Now, my goal was to be a pro basketball player. Again, like I said, there's no way I'm going to go to the NBA. But part of my goal at the time was to maybe play somewhere over in Europe. And so in order to achieve that, I knew I had to play at the highest level I could in Canada. And at the time, it was CIS. And throughout all my hard work, throughout all my training, I finally landed it. I was able to play for the men's basketball team up at UNBC, and it was my first year, my freshman year, when the team actually went CIS. 
And yet, for those of you that have played at elite level sports, you realize real quickly how big you are in a very small pond. <laughs> Especially in Prince George. As soon as I made the team and went up there, I really realized uh, just how little I knew and how well I actually could perform. And that was challenging for me because now this feeling that I was chasing after was a lot harder to grasp. And so for two years, while I had to sit on the bench and I had to learn and I had to work hard and I wasn't seeing the fruit of my labor, I just felt this, this emptiness as I, as I continued to grind after what I wanted. So in a similar way, Acts 3 is going to address this question about what makes us come alive. And so the context we find ourselves in is, is sometime the believers have started forming and living as a church. And we have Peter and John uh, walking up to the temple to pray. And it's at this time, the passage tells us there's a gate called the Beautiful Gate. And scholars kind of note that it's, it's the Nicanor Gate. And it was the most eastern gate that would enter into the court of Gentiles. And the reason why it was so beautiful was that it was constructed with Corinthian brass. A first century historian by the name of Josephus actually writes that this, um, this gate was just so elaborate, so beautiful, that it far outweighed the expectations of the gates that were made of gold or silver. And so it's, it's upon this journey up to the temple to pray that Peter and John run into a, a, an unlikely individual, a lame beggar at the very foot of this gate. And so that's where we find ourselves in. So verse 1. <clears throat> one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. So something that we can recognize in this first passage here is a very common literary technique. And that technique is, is called a chiastic structure. Now a chiastic structure, quite simply, is the, the start of the passage and the end passage actually sandwich in and point towards a key uh, transition or a key theme or something very important that is going on here. And as we see, it starts with them entering to the gate called Beautiful and there's a lame man. And it ends with uh, them leaving the gate called Beautiful with now this lame man being able to walk. And so what's crucial is actually in verse six. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. Well, what, is, what is Peter giving in this moment? Now, some of you would say uh, healing, which is a very obvious answer. Yes, a healing did take place. But I actually, I actually think if we go a little deeper, what he's really giving him is healing that comes through Jesus Christ. See, Peter didn't heal this man. It was Jesus who did. Now, I find this very, uh, very important for us as we, as we consider our overarching theme of what it means to be the church. Part of being the church means that we end up preaching and sharing the gospel with those around us. We go and we share Jesus with those around us. And yet something that I find that's, that's interesting is within our own cultural moment today, one whereby um, we're asked that you keep your faith to the privacy of your homes or to the exclusivity of of your church buildings, but please don't bring in the public sector. And yet this layman who, who was broken, who was clearly, as Acts 4 describes for us actually, he was 40 years old, being lame from birth, broken and in need of something more than just silver or gold. We as Christians and those who claim to follow Christ have something immeasurably greater than silver or gold to give. 
And yet I, I, I sometimes wonder within our own circumstances if we often feel very anxious and nervous to do that. Some of us would feel way more comfortable giving silver or gold than necessarily giving or sharing Jesus with someone else. And believe me, I've been there. And yet, I think there's something crucial that we need to remember is that you and I could do some of the most wonderful deeds possible. We could help out at orphanages. We could go downtown and serve the homeless, which I know some of you do. You know, we could, we could end up taking up jobs that are in the social justice sector, or we could take part in many of the advocacy things that are happening throughout our country as well as the globe. And yet, here's the thing is, no matter how good the deeds that we see that we're doing, if it's not paired with sharing Jesus, then our deeds are done in vain. So, for some of us, this is an encouragement and a reminder for us that we need to continue to share Jesus, which is immeasurably greater than any earthly thing we could ever give. But there's also a flip side to this, and that's the perspective of the lame man for a second. You know, I, I firmly believe that it took just as much faith for this lame man to get up and walk as it did for Peter to reach out in love. You know, for, as, as the passage shows us, Peter himself puts his hand out. And now some of us can read that, and, and that's not meant to be implied that his hand reaching out is to actually hoist him up, but actually it's just an act and a posture of love. We see Jesus doing the exact same thing. And, and for example, Jairus' daughter, when he heals Jairus' daughter, he actually puts his hand out, and he doesn't hoist her up, but helps her up. And yet in the same way, this lame man has to take that same step of faith. There's a step of faith that's needed before he can receive what he's seeking or what he's hoping to seek. Now, I feel like some of us in this moment of, of life, in this season of life, actually, can really resonate with this lame beggar. <laughs> we're broken in some way, and we're seeking a solution, and, and maybe we've sought out earthly solutions, but Jesus is right there, standing at the door, ready to meet our problem face on. And yet it requires a step of faith for that to happen. And we actually see this in the New Testament quite a bit. Another example being the woman who was bleeding uh, for 12 years. For her, she was commended for her faith, but that action of faith was courageously stepping out in order to just touch the hem of Jesus' cloak. And so that's, that's something that's so unique here is that it's an encouragement for us to see that Peter acts in this way, that we can, like him, give Jesus to others but also likewise for those of us that are in need of receptivity right now. We need to also step out in faith. So it's from here that they enter into the temple. Now there's a, there's a descriptor here as, as they enter into the temple, which is the court of Gentiles, we hear this word Solomon's colonnade. Now it was an architectural uh, design, kind of like a portico, a, a, a balcony that was um, created into uh, the temple. And it's important that Luke notes this for us especially is because Jesus himself sometimes taught within this very location. And so here we pick up the story in verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. So right away, something that's so crucial is as they enter and they see this lame man jumping, there's this immediate astonishment. And right away, before any sort of um, uh, accolades or, or anything can be thrown Peter and John's way, Peter right away states who is the one that actually healed. Again, it, it's, it wasn't Peter. It was Jesus. Jesus himself. And that's important because he not only points to Jesus 
as the person who healed him, but these onlookers, some of them are actually some of the people who happen to be at uh, the trial, the trial that condemned Jesus to be put on the cross. And even though they thought they had killed this individual, as we know, the story is different. Being raised to life, even though he had been poor, even though he had been ascended into heaven, here he is once again, healing in front of them, in front of their eyes. And yet, there's there's something also that I, that's kind of funny about this is is what Peter says in verse twelve, the very first thing that he says to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Now, I, I find that kind of an interesting thing to say. I mean, for for you and me, I I don't know about you, but uh, if there was an individual just like this lame beggar that um, we happen to see out in Prince George, and then all of a sudden, one day, maybe he, he walks into your work or he walks uh, uh, into like a coffee shop or something. If we, you and I were to see it, we would act very much like these Israelites did. We'd be just in astonishment and awe. We'd want to know how and, 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 and what happened. And, and we'd be just ecstatic. And yet, I think the posture that Peter's taking here is actually, excuse me, is actually a very important uh, thing for us to remember too. You see, for, for Peter, having been filled with the Holy Spirit and having walked with Christ, he himself can actually say, why does this surprise you? We should be expecting these things. We should be expecting that God wants and does act in great, big, and miraculous ways on a daily basis. And I think for us as Christians, if we claim to be followers of Christ, we should also have that same expectation. Not that we expect God to necessarily act in the way that we want him to, but that he is capable of everything and anything. And so I think that's actually a very interesting thing for us to remember too, that as we, as we go about sharing Christ with others, that we can also expect that God is working and wants to work in ways that would blow our mind. So from there, he dives into a, a very interesting transition where it kind of seems like he starts blaming, right? Four times a sentence is started with the word you. You handed him over. You disowned him. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. Some pretty strong and heavy language on the side of Peter. And yet part of me speculates a little bit that there may be this, this, this sense of agitation in his voice, or maybe this sense of passion in his voice, primarily because he himself denied Jesus three times. He himself can relate to the situation of having denied the very person that he'd followed around for three years, that he himself was the first to admit that he is the Christ. And yet he, here he is, in the same way, um, calling them out in the, in the fashion by which he himself denied. Almost in, a, in an attempt to remind, to, to show them that, hey, like this may be what you have done, but there's a better way. And God wants to redeem this. And that's what I think is so incredible about this whole, uh, this whole sermon that Peter's starting to give to the onlookers. It's that in the Gospel of John, we see that Peter is restored as both a disciple and apostle by Jesus, um, by Jesus Christ. And likewise, it's so fascinating now that after this healing takes place, Peter now has the opportunity to share with these people that Jesus himself wants to restore life within them, to actually wants to restore the relationship and to forgive the sin that they themselves committed against Jesus. What a fascinating, fascinating change of events. Let's continue on. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. 
So it's after, it's after Peter points to Jesus himself having healed. And it's after he exposes uh, these Israelites for their own shortcomings. It's here that he actually shows how Jesus saves people. He actually gives um, three very important points that actually shows and displays for us um, just the process of, of a conversion, of, of what happens when we're in that moment of conversion. So verse 19 states, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So again, we know that the word repent, as many of us have heard before, means to turn away from our sin. And yet it also means not only to turn away from our sin, but to turn back to God, turn back to the source of life. So that he may wipe away your sin. Now that word wipe away is very interesting. Uh, it's, the word in Greek is exalifo, to wipe away. And what's fascinating is actually this word conjures up, uh, especially in, in the first century, an image of papyrus and ink. So the thing about papyrus, especially in the first century, is unlike our paper, the ink can't actually sink into uh, the papyrus parchment itself. And so all one had to do is, if they were writing on this piece of parchment, all one had to do was to take a piece of cloth, to soak it in some water, and they could just wipe off the ink. Now, isn't that just a fascinating image? In the same way that someone could wipe ink off of papyrus, God himself when he forgives us our sins, wipes away the sin that mars our very souls. And I just think that's just such a beautiful image to, to just picture as we come seeking forgiveness, looking to be forgiven of the things that we have done. Now he, he continues on in verse 19, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So again, times of refreshing. And in that word, uh, the word in Greek being anapsixis, try saying that one three times fast, is very fascinating in the sense that it's not just refreshment, but can also mean relaxation from disturbing circumstances. In a word, peace. And so at the same time as we have our sins cleansed, God gives us this peace which only comes from the Holy Spirit. And this piece is different from, from definitions that we would find anywhere else in our, in our world today. And so we need a, like a biblical definition of peace. And so what biblical peace is, is the state of harmony that is available to believers through having a right relationship with God and others and is especially associated with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, did you catch that, that very interesting word, very powerful word in, uh, in this definition I just gave? The word is available. It is available to all believers. And it's actually this feeling of peace that we get despite the painful circumstances that we go through that actually is a signifier that the Holy Spirit, God himself, his very presence is with us. And I know and I can assume that there's maybe some of you out there right now that are really needing that peace. That maybe the circumstances of your life are actually creeping in such a way that you, you're just, you're not feeling this peace. And so I commend you to continue to pray and seek the Lord's peace that he may be able to give it to you despite the circumstances that we feel. Now the third thing, the third thing is found in verse 20. So after the forgiveness of sins, after these times of refreshing, that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus, uh, so some of you might be thinking that sentence structure is a little weird. It kind of makes it sound like there's two messiahs, right? Well, the first thing that we need to uh, look at here is that what Peter is implying and what the Greek actually implies as well is that the Israelites were long awaiting the coming of the Messiah. And they were waiting for this liberated ruler and, excuse me, this liberating ruler and who would come and just free them from the oppression of the Romans. And yet what, what Peter's stating in this sentence is that actually the long-awaited Messiah that you're seeking is Jesus and whom you are expecting to come is in fact Jesus. Verse 21, 
Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So in this third part, what Peter is pointing to the fact is we live in what Acts calls the last days. And the last days, quite simply, is the time between Jesus having ascended into heaven and the expected return that he will be coming soon. And the point of that is actually one of joy. (laughs) That we, as Christians, seek and we await the day that he returns. Because the day that he returns, all of a sudden it's in that moment that both heaven and earth will be renewed. They'll be restored once again. Reunited. Things like murder, things like war, the sin of, of, that afflicts everything through illnesses and through uh, disturbing things that we see will be no more, where every tear will be wiped clean and God's holy people will be, surra- will be surrounded by the heavenly angels that are worshiping the very presence of God. And so it's something to look forward to. It's something that Peter's instructing to the Israelites that this long-awaited Messiah is indeed Jesus and he will be coming back. Now the last passage finishes, uh, finishes what we're covering today by focusing in on some, very, uh, some language that would be very familiar to the Israelites. Verse 24. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So Peter, speaking to these, these fellow Jews of his, what he is noting here. And what he is stating, as much of this passage has been, is that the Messiah is culminated in Jesus and that the Old Testament has foretold this. That the Old Testament prophecies find their realization in Jesus himself. Right? And then the next part, and I think regardless of, of, regardless of any subject, I think this part is always an important thing to state. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Now this this, uh, coincides well with what Paul states in his epistles as well. That forgiveness and the gospel were first brought to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And yet the underlying theme about all of this is since since Genesis 3, since the fall of humanity, we have been dead in our sin. And as we continue to sin, and for those of us that, you know, have chosen to reject the Lord, we find ourselves standing condemned by the righteous judgment of God himself. But, and this is the most common theme throughout the entire, and the entirety of the Bible, but if we are willing to repent, if we are willing to turn back to God, he is gracious enough loving enough and willing enough to forgive us our sin. This whole passage highlights uh, those who were dead in their sin and coming to life. We have a very interesting situation here where this lame beggar who, in, in accordance to the, the situation that he was living in, especially in the first century world, to be disabled was, it would have been essentially better to have been dead. And yet Jesus heals him in a radical way that brings him life. And in the same way, Peter is trying to commend and trying to point the Israelites to, again, recognize that they themselves, even though they are physically well, that they have everything, that they themselves are dead on the inside, and that there is one, Jesus of Nazareth, who can change that for them. You know, I I shared at the start part of my testimony. And the thing that I want to just share with you near the end here is that I continued to put Jesus to the side as I sought to try and come alive through basketball. And it was actually in my third year that the depravity of my living, my partying lifestyle, the things that I had turned to to cope with 
um, with this lack of feeling that I was not getting from the very sport that I loved. The weight of that depravity hit me all in one moment. And I remember, I remember it was December, and I was in my room. It was cold, and I just had this thought come to me, and it was a thought that, quite frankly, wasn't my own. And the thought was this, you need to choose. And I knew right there in that moment that I'd been living like a hypocrite for a good portion of my life. That I had essentially turned away from the Lord and sought after my own means and sought after my own desires. But as I had been doing that, I was still praying. I was barely coming to church. I barely read my Bible. I was an English major <laughs> and I loved to read books and yet I barely read my Bible but I was still praying, and I'm like, why? I feel like a hypocrite in this moment. And so I knew in that moment that I either needed to, I was either going to just say that God didn't exist, and I was going to continue to live the life of atheism that I was basically living, or I was going to choose to get on my knees to surrender my life over to Jesus Christ, and to follow and come under that authority. And so I chose the latter that night, and even though since then it's been a journey for me in terms of my character and, and many of the things needing to change and having to rid myself of the habitual sin that has been a part of my life, I will tell you that there was one thing that did switch overnight. And that was the things that I used to desire, the things that I cared so much for, I now hated. And the things that I used to never get joy in when it came to being a part of the Christian faith. I now find a lot of love in. Ravi Zacharias, the late Ravi Zacharias, once said that God did not come, uh, excuse me, God did not send his son to make bad people good. He sent his son to make dead people alive. And that is the theme of this whole passage, that through Jesus, God has given the gift of bringing dead people to life. And so my application is, is fairly simple. And I just want to ask you, who do you identify with in this passage? As I noted before, maybe some of you find yourself feeling kind of like the lame beggar. There's something broken within your life, whether it's something emotional, maybe it's something spiritual, maybe it is something physical, but something's broken. And maybe you've tried, you've, you've tried some different worldly things that, um, to, that you thought would maybe fix the problem. But maybe what is actually needed is that, step, is that step in faith to know and to realize that God is waiting there for you, wanting to help you in that situation, but he's waiting for you to open the door. If you find yourself in that situation, I just want to encourage you to find um, someone of spiritual maturity that you can confide in. It can be um, any one of the pastoral staff. It could be if you're a part of a life group, a fellow member of that life group, or even the life group leader themselves. Maybe it's a, a trusted friend or, or family member, but I would ask you that you would not delay. You would go, you would reach out to these people, and you would ask them to help you pray to identify what is that step of faith, and then to ask the Lord for the courage to go forward and to step into that. Maybe some of you find yourselves uh, similar to the onlookers, Maybe on the surface, everything's quite fine. Maybe to other people, that there really doesn't look like there seems to be much of an issue, but deep inside, you're actually spiritually dead. If that is a situation that you find yourself in, then what Peter mentions in 17 to 23 is, is for you. And I would, I would highly encourage you that in this moment, when the service ends, don't, don't delay, but get on your knees. Whether alone or with someone else, get on your knees and seek the forgiveness that God is so willing to grant. Ask him that he would wipe away whatever sin has caused you to reach the spiritual uh, death in your life. And ask him that he may refresh your soul in such a way that you could feel the Holy Spirit's presence welling and filling within you. That no matter the circumstances, you can still feel at peace knowing that God is with you always. And lastly, maybe some of you are very much like Peter and John. Maybe some of you, uh, yeah, aren't feeling broken in some sort of sense. Or maybe some of you, uh, are, are like Peter and John, are, are very spiritually alive. 
For you, I want to commend you and encourage you in seeking the Lord by asking him to present someone to you that you can share Jesus with. I want to say it's, it's a blessing to feel the way you do, but it's not just meant for you. We're meant to reach out to others. We're meant to share Jesus with others. And so I would highly encourage you that you would, you would pray, pray uh, to see an individual, that you would ask God to bring an individual into your life that you can be able to share Jesus with. For that is what it means to be the church. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to gather today. We thank you so much, Lord, that despite uh, our troubles and our circumstances, that you are there with us every step of the way, whether we feel it or not. Lord, you know those behind the screen. And Lord, you love them and you care for them so deeply. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would just be present with them in this moment. Help them to know clearly who it is they identify with. And I pray, Lord, that you would just give them the love, the perfect love that expels all fear to come before you with their petitions, with their requests, with their thanksgiving, Lord, seeking you fully in everything that they do. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us life and that you raise us from how we feel on the inside to being much more. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Go in peace. Cheers.